Hello, Reese from the Point Music Podcast th- thingy. Ah, uh, first one for 2024, and holy crap, I get to interview Lucius from Cog. That uh, that I, I could tick that off. I've Cog have been one of my favorite bands for quite some time now, and uh, they've got the vinyl tour coming up in March because they're celebrating the the release of their seminal albums um sharing space and the new normal pardon me onto vinyl and they're going up and down the east coast and it's going to be sick so the dates will be in the podcast thingy um the description below um i do hope you enjoy this one lucius is very uh in how do you say this one he's a phenomenal drummer and two just a, a great interview subject simple as that i hope you enjoy this one i really did Ladies and gentlemen, people of all sorts, this is Lucius from COG. Rolling Lucius from COG. Finally, we got to make this happen. There was a few sort of of false stars, but, you know, things are the way they are, and we made this happen. Um, How are you, mate? Not too bad, thanks. Not too bad. Yeah, it's been a pretty good day. I've actually actually had three days of surfing, so that's been pretty good. We've had some good, yeah, some good swell come in. So, um, yeah, a bit burnt and a bit kind of tired, you know, doing three in, three in a row. I haven't done that, don't get to do that that much. But, um, yeah, the surfing's been really, really grounding, really good. You know, I love it so much. So, feeling good. It's making me want to go get wet now. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long time since I've actually gotten a wave yet. But, been, yep, I'm on holiday, so I should actually fucking make that happen. Absolutely, get out there. Yeah, whereabouts are you yeah. at the moment? Uh, I'm in, well, this is my recording studio in Byron, Key okay. Sound Studios, which I run. So, uh, you know, produce, mix and, and master and do things out of here, uh, record bands. And I'm basically in the industrial estate in Byron. So only like, you know, five minute drive kind of to the lighthouse in Byron and, so and the town. Stone little town. Wood Brewery and that sort of shit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Cool. I know where you are then. That's sweet. Yeah, I was wondering if yeah. there's any sort of... So that means if Byron's got swell, we might have a little touch of it up on towards Rome on, near the sunny coast there. So, a little Yeah, bit it's, been, it's been pretty good. It's, yeah, it's been pushing through, like, you know, that kind of solid three to five foot, you know, kind of, kind of breaks, which has been good. That sounds tasty. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's enough surfy fucking talk. Um, the reason why we <laughs> the reason why we've got you on in the first place is to talk about Cog going on tour. This is the the vinyl tour, and the reason why you're celebrating this is that two of your most amazing albums, the last two big releases you guys did before you sort of went on the hiatus, um, the new normal and sharing spaces, is, is finally being released on vinyl. So, how are you feeling about this? Yeah, definitely a milestone and something we've wanted to happen for a long, long time. And when we got our, um, we put out a bit of a press release that we got our rights back from the record company after 15 years. Mm. Um, basically, the record company was like, it just was kind of dysfunctional. It wasn't really a working label as, as such. So, uh, you know, but we were still in contract. So, you know, we couldn't really do anything with our music. So we had to wait that out. So to actually, um, yeah, I think it was, last year january that's when we kind of got got it back and then we started to put into works okay well what what can we do with it what do we want to do with the music how do we want to present it because you know you obviously got to take responsibility of it where it's going to go how it's going to be put out and we just thought vinyl was a a, a real natural progression yep being lovers of of you know kind of vinyl albums and stuff growing up and whatever and i think that that when it's tangible like that and it's packaged like that um sonically as well it's slightly different obviously than an mp3 through the through the um in, you know the spotify's or whatever um you know there's a quality and a and, a, and it gives a, and a value another sort of sense of value to the music and mm. uh it just seemed like the first logical kind of step you know like to just kind of take that get it prepped get it ready um we all agreed on it um and yeah kind of move forward and get it get it put out so it's, it's taken a little it's a little while we had to change we, we were going to get it done in the czech republic yeah something happened there with the manufacturing which was unfortunate um so we had to ship you know bring it all back to australia and melbourne and doug from bear records is um rare, rare records sorry is um 
taking taking it by the helm and it's it's pretty uh close to finishing now yeah well you really start hang on one second this ah, that bad boy you released yep. was that 2016 that was just visiting that you put that onto vinyl yeah that was that, that was a, and that's something we did have our copyright and ownership with which was our first um you know music that we'd ever made pretty much and presented it to the public and uh, that was really cool to get that put on vinyl. That felt really, it's considering how we made that album and how we made that music too, to finally get it kind of printed on vinyl was quite exciting. How so, was it? Um, was it, what was different about? It? Well, I think it was just you know the 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 way that the um, the way that the the actual we basically created that music purely more for demo purposes and right. to like try and get a, a record deal and then re-record it properly um so we, you know we out outlaid a little bit of money obviously to kind of get the the, the right tools and whatever to record it back then it was cast it was a task cam 688 <laughs> um 12 track we were you know recorded drums really everything was recorded really minimal i brought it back i played the bass on it we went to another studio and tracked some vocals on it but it was all done more like in a demo kind of sense, a good demo sense. And um, when we took it to labels and things like that, no one wanted to know. And it really just resided like, in, you know, from uh, on a DAT kind of thing, TDK cassette, cassette tapes as well. So, you know, we were using that kind of technology. Uh, and then no one was interested. So we just decided, you know what, the demos actually sound pretty good. Let's just put those out. They've got a bit of a vibe. Um, and I went from there and... Um, and then obviously, yeah, we you know we printed up CDs. Um, it got a little bit of traction on on some radio stations, and and then yeah, we kind of made vinyl. So just the just the timeline and the the, the evolution of of how that um, played out was interesting, you know. And I think to you know anyone who does any musician who does or creates vinyl, it's a little bit like a holy grail of mm. of music cementing your music in something. You know what I mean? Because yeah. While you've got while you've got that, if the, if the internet goes down or you can't do this or you can't do that, you know, if you've got at least you've got the music in your hand, uh, so to speak, you, you know, it will always be with you. The force will be with you. I've got so <laughs> many tabs in my head open right now after just listening to you talk about that. Um, all right, so basically, my understanding of with with the record label one, if they sort of fizzled out which you basically what you're saying is right but the contract was basically saying that you couldn't release anything even though the shouldn't there be like some fucking clause or loophole where it would allow you to get out of that contract if that label dissolved yeah you could probably you could probably go down that avenue and um but there wasn't anything specific um i think for them they have to deregister they have to get their shit together to you know to basically take it off the table yeah. as, as a non-functioning entity uh, within the business world. So it was still hanging around. It was still, you know, somewhat just a label, even though it, was, it wasn't really, to my knowledge, um, you know, a working label. So, you know, the music kind of sat with it, you know, or the contract sat with it. And, um, wow. you know, I think we also you have to take some a bit of responsibility we took a hiatus for like five years so you know that probably gave the label a bit of like well they're not doing anything either yeah so you know there was there was a little bit of that going on so but you know the term was the term and, and it ran its course so um yeah it's it's um it was it was good to finally get it back you kind of had a, like um it, it made me think of tools like you know when they had their break between Anima and Lateral Atlas because there was a dispute with Volcano mm. Records and then they couldn't release anything and that was what was making spinning through my head when listening to you talk about that I went fuck yeah similar and what's it what's it what's the deal with prog bands I'm getting caught with that shit <laughs> <laughs> probably just probably just too into the music too and not enough into the business yeah yeah it's, it's just like you know you. You go into the with the best of intentions with the people that you're with, and you, you know, you shake hands, you have a contract, you read the contract, you understand it to your best of your ability. I think we had a pretty good one. Um, some people get tied up for a lot longer mm. um, with a lot more albums. Ours was based off like songs, like yeah. per or per song. So we we it's like you know because I think they saw the the future of digital world, you know, the digital world that was coming, it was more based around songs, not an album con or concepts of albums. Yeah. 
So, um, I mean, we finished delivering the 28 songs, which, which, well, which is what it was. And from the 28 songs of delivery, that's when the 15-year period started. Oh. Um, so, yeah, and kind of pretty much after we released Sharing Space, it was like, what, two years later that we kind of, you know, got in that position of, you know, going on uh, having a hiatus for like a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but it was like for five years. Yeah. And um, and then, what, we were probably seven years in to 15-year term. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's just, that's just business. That's just part of business. And, you know, if I, I think, if you can retain, it depends the inf- what the infrastructure you have, you know, but if you are an artist or a musician, you can retain your rights. You've got enough functioning capital to hire who you need to hire on per basis for whatever skill. Um, and then you can keep the ownership and the copyright and all that stuff. Um, that's probably the best way to go because then you don't have to, you know, end up in these those type of positions, unfortunately. I was going to ask you, what, do you think record labels are as... Um important today and like particularly for independent artists i personally i don't think given that how easy it is to distribute your music and everything uh, yeah I, well it, it, yeah you can look at it in a couple of ways i think you're right in some way and then another way you know if you're an artist like most musicians most artists are struggling mm-hmm. you know when it comes to mm-hmm. money and capital and investing capital and investing money in in things so they have to essentially you know, if they really want to try and, and uh, forge ahead in the music industry and, and make some kind of a statement, um, they need the capital. So sometimes you need to go to someone who's got the capital, whether it's a record label or whatever. And yeah. and some of these record labels can have the infrastructure too. You know, they can have, you know, good label advice. They can have, you know, people who know how to distribute the music properly, um, who've got, you know, got experience because that's their world that they work in. So, you know, it... it if, I think if you're younger and you're kind of willing to learn the process of, you know, all the, the dynamics of how to, to deliver music, not not just kind of throw it up on Spotify or just, you know, because anyone can do that. Mm. That's that's easy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's there's more to it than that, you know, and, and, and I think sometimes when you have people who are skilled, passionate, and they're in their area of, of you know, kind of the record label style of functioning, um, that can be a real asset, you know, if you've all got a vision and you've all got a clear vision and um, and, a, and an understanding of the goal, well, then, you know, I think, and it's nice to have teamwork as well. I remember with COG, I was like, we were, when we were going through the process and um, we had, you know, people at the label that we really, really liked and, and they really lo- loved us and, um, you know, when there was a win, it was, you know, it was a good win. It felt good, yeah. you know. You, you worked hard and you, you, you worked hard and then you got the reward and it felt good that you could share that, you know. So, um, yeah, there's probably two sides of the, of the coin there, like anything, you know, to some degree. But um, it, it's all definitely about trying to strike uh, the best deal you can and find, the you know, definitely the right people who really understand what you're doing and, mm. and you know, and, and go, kind of go from there. But, yeah, you know, we're, I guess it is a different world now, as you know, and, and, and you can definitely – move and shake on your own a lot more you know just whether you get lost at sea and you know like a piss in the ocean is is another thing right because anyone can just release anything online doesn't mean it's going to go anywhere That's you know? it, man. the amount of music that comes comes through to me through my website and through press and in, in independence and that um it's interesting to see how long all of these artists actually last like some of them they just read yeah. something and then they uh, i go to find them a year later and they're gone and then there's some yeah well the, the yeah the big i think one of the big takeaways from that is that cog was very boots on the ground mm. so it was a brick you know brick by brick basis building of the of the and a lot of uh sacrificing of time and and whatever else you wanted to do with your life uh, and putting it into you know playing live shows and and driving everywhere and playing everywhere and um playing to no one, sometimes playing to a 1,000 to 10,000, you know, but just, you know, religiously just kept on boots on the ground, um, you know, and that I think that really built the foundations more than just having this virtual world that you think you're going to exist and you're going to, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to lay some real solid foundations there. I think it, for us anyway, uh, it was definitely in the, um, it was definitely in the boots on the ground, 
show by show uh, and building it that way, you know, which maybe some people, they just don't want to do the hard work anymore. You know, that, that was a lot of hard work, a lot of miles, you know, and, <laughs> no, I re- you I know, remember it. We, I remember when, how often yeah. you guys used to come up this way and like teaming up with like the likes of like Butterfly Effect and, and, and Melodicy, like we're talking off of yeah. there about and how yeah. relentless that touring schedule would have been. I mean, you guys finally eventually got into big day outs and that too, which was very fortuitous in, in a sense. But for the heavy scene in particular, which you guys are a part of, and I like to think that I, I'll call them the big four, basically, which is you guys, Butterfly Effect, Carnival, and Dead Letter Circus. You guys were like the, the big four prog acts that were consistently appearing on festival stages and giving little like these other people like the taste of slightly heavy you're not in, like nowhere near like parkway drive or anything like that this is this is the the more digestible heavy i think i would like to call it and cerebral heavy because you guys you're very cerebral in, in in your lyrics and your music as well and that's what prog is all about and the the amount of groundwork that you guys actually did was was phenomenal. I don't I don't see too many bands, particularly in the heavy sort of circuit, do it as often now. There are some, there are some amazing ones that do it, but it's not quite the same. I don't know if it's because of cost factor. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just about to say it's uh, probably a lot of it is to do with costs, and even though it was still expensive when we were doing it, mm-hmm. um, you know, every cent went back into the band, and we we used to put on a lot of local shows, you know, we, uh, where we lived. So that was that was cost effective. Um, but there were times where we would, you know, drive to Melbourne every week just to do a, re- a residency, mm. um, you know, and and then come back to do the day jobs. <laughs> um, so you know, you just have to try and think as as kind of you know smart as you could, and and uh, you know when the timing was right, strike when that was right. And, um, you know, kind of build it, build it that way. I spent a lot of time, you know, I've got a f- funny story about you just as an example, you know, trying to get the, this is pre internet and all that stuff, but I used to go around to all the news agencies and I used to uh, go to, you know, the surfing mags, the skate mags, the music mags, the, you know, fishing mags, women's day, didn't matter. Rolling stone didn't matter. It was like, I'd, and I'd slip in cog flyers in all the magazines you know i call it slippery slip-ins <laughs> yeah it was, that was my you know it was it was like well this is uh, it's like the only way i'm gonna these people are gonna buy these magazines if a flyer falls out they, i'll see it you know and i thought it was pretty funny because you know it, i used to think that p- putting a flyer in you know rolling stone magazine where you probably pay like two grand to put one in there i yep. just <laughs> put it in <laughs> And uh, people would see and go, oh, okay, who's this band, you know? It's funnier. So, I mean, you know, you're just kind of thinking, (laughs) what's that? It's funnier that's in the woman's day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I slipped a few in there (laughs) for sure. (laughs) And, um, yeah, and then they started putting plastic on on all the magazines and I thought, well, I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) Game over. (laughs) All right, so... The last three tastes that we had of, of new stuff from, from Cog was drawn together, Alter States and, and The Middle. Now, given that there's only one other band that I put up there with you guys in the, t- in the terms of like actually portraying um, the, 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 what the world's doing right now in an, in an Australian take on it, particularly in the heavy scene, and that's Mammal. So Zeke, Zeke basically is very cerebral but in a piss taking kind of way whereas when Flynn's is more his approach is more it's, it's kind of straightforward but at the same time a little bit of a puzzle that you got to try and work out but what I'm saying is that the climate right now in the last four years in particular there's got to be some new shit bro with you three <laughs> yeah you'd think so wouldn't you yeah um yeah you'd definitely think so well, I think you know there's there's a couple of reasons for that. I think that back when we were writing the music we were writing and the narrative that we were writing to, mm-hmm. it was pretty pretty easy to see if you were good doing your research or you're you know you, you're having a look at things and you're interested in world you know kind of political affairs and and all that type of stuff. You you kind of could get a, a quite a grasp on where things were at and what was happening. Mm. Whereas I think now because there's so much different ways of, you know, getting your information yep. 
um, you've got to be very discerning about what you what you're looking at, and you've got to you know whether it's true or it's false or it's you know there's a many many different ways to create propaganda in in so many different ways. So I think when you when you sit back and you you observe and you be the observer and you know you've got your eye on certain things and you're just seeing how they're playing out because what I've learned in in this whole thing is that as things play out though things can be flipped and and tricked and thrown in a different type of paradigm and it can you know throw the axis off so so to speak mm. and then all of a sudden it's it's a different type of narrative and I think at this point in time, it's very, given it's 2024, there's an election coming up over in the States. I think, you know, that's going to be quite interesting. I think mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's lots of things at play. So instead of having a, you know, I mean, we all know the system's corrupt. Yeah. And we've already said that, you know, music. It's, 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 it's so, you know, the reliance comes back on solely on ourselves, you know, to take responsibility. And that's, you know, the work, you know, kind of like the middle working class of any kind of, you know, republic or democracy is is the backbone of any country and is the stronghold. Um, and you know, what I will share is I think that that's, you know, basically what they're trying to destroy or they're trying to get rid of, or they want to water down or they want to completely gut the the kind of middle class working class because that is the backbone of any real country. Mm -hmm. And um, at the moment, I think it's, you know, it's just sitting back, observing and seeing where the kind of chips fall. But as I said, we all know it's corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's beyond repairable. So what do you do when you get to that situation? Well, you just have to rely on yourself and your community and your people around you. And it's, the, you know, it's the people, like my grandfather used to say, he was, he was in, he went into politics and he said, it's the people that run the country. It's not the politicians. So, you know, that says it all. It's supposed to be. We're supposed to be, yes, yeah. but in actual fact it is because, you know, we're the ones working, you know, we're the ones, you know, with the ideas, we're the ones that, you know, do the hard yards and, and bring to the table what needs to be brought to the table. You know, these these, these servants in these, you know, positions of so-called power mm. are supposed to honour certain things, but, you know, as we know, it's all corrupt and they don't do that. So, you know, part of our narrative has just been poking the finger at that and also just trying to, you know, bring the, the responsibility back onto ourselves with, with, you know, the way we have to conduct ourselves and live our lives so we can, you know, live somewhat in, you know, some kind of civilised society, if you will, you know what I mean, to a degree. So, we'll, you know, but with what's playing out, we'll see what happens because I think there's this, it's, it's grab your popcorn and sit back and see what's, you know, <laughs> where the chip's going to fall, and, you know, and then I think maybe Cog will have something to say to some degree. But there's, you know, there's also... You know, you, you don't want to. It's not just about all that type of. Um, you know, we we like to kind of delve into other stuff as well, personal stuff, and you know, maybe what we're you know experiencing in our personal lives, and what you know with this life that we're experiencing. What does that mean? How 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 are we feeling now? You know, what's what's the what's the essence of the spirit that we're holding inside ourselves? You know, where where's it at? You know, what's it seeing? What's it, what's the experience that we're having? You know. So maybe it's a lot of that. We have to, have, you know, bring a lot of that into, you know, when it comes to words and it comes to lyrics and melodies, um, you know, I'm sure all that stuff will kind of play out. Our problem, we've got lots of our problem at the moment and is that is a, it's a timing thing because we are, you know, we are independent. Yeah. Um, we haven't got a record company giving us, you know, you know, giving us money to sit in a room and write music. So we have to, we've all got separate businesses and we've got families so we have to you know obviously on a on a that side of um you know who we are which we love and then try to find the time to get together to write you know as you get older it's, just, it's definitely a young person's game when you as being a musician it's like if you can really between that yep. 17 to like you know 30 year period i wouldn't even say just that. really What's that? Seventeen to twenty-five is the gap you've got. I would say these days. Though. Yeah, it's kind of it's yeah it's kind of a bit of the gap you've got. Yeah, and if you could, you know, I was I was slightly older. I think we were kind of in in the little kind of early thirties to some degree. But mm. um, yeah, you really want to work really really hard, really really hard. And now, you know, Cog's in a in a somewhat fortunate position. We did a lot of hard work, and there's you know there's a lot of people who still really like what we've done, and you know they're waiting for new music and. 
and we would love to deliver new music. Um, you know, we're still all very, you know, connected on musically how we feel about what, how we would like to write music. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so there's no real issue other than just trying to find the time, you know, to, you know, cause it's, you know, it's hard enough trying to keep a band together, let alone, you know, you've got families and businesses and all other dynamics and, yep. and, you know, trying to bring it together to, to then create the art that's going to, you know, be as good if not, if not better than what you've done in the past. So you, you want to really make sure that you're, you're giving all your attention to that, you know, um, and you're not just showing up because, you know, oh, you, you can exploit the people that you've, that have been following you or, or whatever. You want to be very sincere about it, you know, and then organic about it. Um, and that, a six piece. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's the other thing. Well, that's right. Yeah. But even, yeah, you get more members. It's even, it's even harder to keep it. Yeah. Yep. So, but, you know, we're pretty lucky because we're, we're, you know, obviously Luke and Flynn are brothers and I've, I've known them since they were 13 because we all grew up in the same, you know, place in Bondi. Yep. Um, so we're all like, you know, and we just live 20 minutes apart. Uh, I've got the, the recording studio here. So we've actually got all the tools, you know, we've got all the tools at our disposal. We've got lots of riffs. We've got lots of bits and pieces. Every time we come in to rehearse, we we sit down and we start jamming and then we, you know, get the iPhone out and just press record and just, you know, yep. just catalog yep. all the riffs and, yeah, yeah, you know, just, in, I mean, whether they come out or not, who knows, but um, I would love to. I think the other guys would too. It's just, as I said, just trying to find the time, mate, and, um, yeah, that's probably if I was to, you know, say to any of our people who like what we do or whatever, it's it's, it's virtually that is the reason why, you know. So it's, yeah, it's it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance and it's um, trying to find that time can be quite challenging. So... I was just thinking one of my favorite shows I caught of you guys was actually I'm pretty sure it was one of your first shows back in 2016 or 17 and you played the Northern and so it was a home show okay. for you guys and I'd take Yeah, right. Uh, it wasn't she wasn't my wife at the at the time she was just my girlfriend at the time but um she'd never seen you guys or heard of you before she normally listens to sort of like like Oka and that kind of stuff right so she doesn't listen to the heavier sort of side of things and I took sure. it and she didn't know what to expect. But yeah, she loved the people watching of it. But it was it was probably one of my favorite shows of you guys because of the intensity that was there because you could see it on your faces when you were playing how much you fucking loved being on stage and you're like, we missed this kind of fucking thing. But it was mm. also the vibe of being a home show, I, I guess, too, because there was it was packed that night. It was, yeah, pretty mental in the Northern. Um, yeah. So it, it, this is what you're looking forward to being on tour with with the vinyl tour. It's just just that just the three of you knowing that vibe on stage, and you you remember why you're doing this in the first place. Not the recording. The recording thing's cool, and running songs is cool, but the playing live bit. Yeah. Yeah, in front of your fans and that sort of shit. That's the reason why you do this, right? Yeah, oh, a lot of it is. Yeah, because it's it's something that we like to do. Is you know you learn your craft over time, and you. You, you get good at what you you or you feel like you get you get hopefully getting better mm. at what you do and every time you, you get on stage it's a chance to you know be more in that pocket of developing yourself as a musician and and seeing how you can tweak it or or, or make it better and and um you know and just and just deliver a good show and just do something that's different that you haven't been doing for a while you know like it's exciting for, for that reason for that very very reason funnily enough were you, <clears throat> excuse me, you're talking about that show. I saw some of the merchandise that's coming out for this tour mm. and the photo on the front is we've called the shirt the spine and it's got the, it's got the lyrics on the back, just the little poetry from the, the start of the song. But it's got a photo from, from the Northern All right. that was taken by, by a guy called um, a good friend of ours, Kane. He was out in the surf with me today. And um, and he took that photo and, and it, it completely expresses what you're saying. Like if you, if you see the photo and that was from that show, the Northern, it was right. like our first one back. Yep. Yeah, and it's on it's on the touring shirt, uh, the spine shirt that we're going to be putting out for this tour as a merch thing. So, um, but yeah, that, when I look at that photo uh, and I see us in that photo, I can re- I really it's really interesting to see yourself in that position because it. it it does look like you're you're throwing it all on the line, and you're very passionate about what you're doing, and it's an experience that you really, 
uh, immersing yourself in. Yeah. Uh, and I think every every show we try to, you know, we try to reach that benchmark if we if we can. You know, it's it's literally removing ourselves to some degree and just, you know, being the, you know, being the vehicle to li- deliver the sonic music. And, you know, hopefully it's going to touch people. People are going to have a good time. Um, and we can just jam to these songs, you know. And and these songs are quite challenging too, you know. That's what makes it fun too, you know. It's just sort of for I, I go out and do many different gigs and shows and play with lots of different projects. And the cog is like another beast in, it, in itself. So when it's, you know, when it, hits, when it gets time to... To, to put the cog hat on and, and set up the kit in that regard, it's it's there's a lot to it. It's like, it's oh, yeah. like what have, what have I got myself into here? One of, one of my favorite things was um, when, when like I was explaining to you off air how like I was in bands that supported you, and one of the things um, I used to like doing was going side of stage and just watching you play from side of stage. Like I'm, I'm a bass player, but like and I used to watch Luke a lot and going, yeah, this is sick. But then I just sneak around the side and I'll probably be standing there with liquor more than likely. Just watch, watching what you're doing because that was when you had the like. Did you have like a, a big fucking gong thing or something like that, or was that was that liquor that? Happened? Yeah, I've always I've, I've always had the the gong. Yeah, um, which you know w- was kind of like you know because there's parts in the music where it requires a bit more of that washy type of sound and yeah. and it feels you know sounds nice to kind of give that uh, that you know that kind of dynamic sound quality and backing to the music. Um, also, you know, to some de- degree, it was a, it was a, a kind of like a, no- a note of respect to um, Rob Hurst from from Midnight Oil, as because yeah. growing up as a drummer, he was one of the drummers mm-hmm. that I really loved watching. Like you're saying, like I would watch him, and I got to see them a, f- a few times, and um, and he always had that gong. Um, so that was a little bit of a you know tribute to him. Okay, that's cool. Uh, in, in honor of him, really, um, you know, just just having that there, and, and and I always used to find as a kid when I used to when I used to watch him play, and he had it behind him. I used to find it quite striking that he had this kind of gong behind him, and then he passionately kind of you know in some of the songs i think it was power and the passion or something yeah. like that down 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 that when i'm stuck in my room dang it you know yeah he'd play the gong before the song you know and and it was just it was that intensity that built up it was exciting you know it sounded great see, so uh, and i think i think rob's a great player see that to me it sounds like you're having a slightly religious experience watching rob hurst play right so me watching you guys, you're one of the rare bands that I actually have a, a spiritual kind of experience with, and I don't want to get all woo-woo and shit, but basically it's because of the structure of the songs and how mesmerizing it actually is, because you get into this, some of the songs you get into that full three-four sway where you're just doing this whole, like, yeah, okay, and you kind of lose yourself into it because it's not so heavily focused on the lyrics all the time. You got, you, you can tell that you guys get lost in that music as well. And that that does. I just, I just want you to know that does transfer to the audience because we're sitting there just going, right? We're having an experience here that's just not just seeing another band. We're actually like getting swooped into this fucking moment. Yeah, well, that's super cool. You know, that's great. I mean, that's what you want to. I mean, there's many factors happening, isn't there? You know, at that, that point in time, you've got the, you've got the, you know, the people on the stage that are in in invoking their passion and their spirit they're, they're in their spirited sense of self you know like they you're really seeing a side to us when we play which is a very vulnerable side to some degree um but also it's a very passionate side and it's it's somewhat you know because we're using the you know getting all woo where we're using all the vibrational aspects of sound and and the dynamics of sound and 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 the tonality of sound too yeah. you know it's like you know trying to find the right you know, whenever we write a song, you know, it's it's, it's about it's got to have that feeling. You know, it's got to have, as the Beach Boys say, you know, a good vibration. There's got to be a, a vibrational quality to the sound that is is a is a nice sensation to hear or feel. Yeah. Um, and that can you know give a spirited uh, sense of self. You know, in in terms of like feeling exhilarated or good or or. or you know, I mean, you know, music can do many different things and many different dynamics for sure. Um, but I, I think, yeah, for, for us, if you're getting that type of a, a somewhat, you know, feeling in, in that spirited sense, that's that's a really cool thing because that, that's, I think, from our hearts, that's how we like to kind of yeah. uh, hope that the crowd and the audience 
have some type of you know spirited sense of themselves you know that they're that they're feeling and they're you know being involved in the experience with us you know so yeah yeah all right, Lucius, I'm going to wrap this up because it's like past the half hour mark and I normally try and keep to that. But it's been yeah, cool, mate. amazing chatting to you. Um, good luck at the, the tour. I'm going to put the tour dates up in, into the podcast section and in the article as well. So you're touring throughout March. Um, there's quite a few dates in there. Um, I'm going to be at the Brisbane show. I'm keen for this one at the Princess Theatre. Cool. March, awesome. March 8th, I think that one is. Um, yeah, yep. congrats on getting these albums back into the world into a hard hard format and uh we're looking yeah. forward to seeing it on tour if you hang on the line then i'll have a quick debrief with you but um keen to see cog on tour everyone else you need to do it this is the vinyl tour coming out there everyone this has been lucius from cog see you later thanks mate thanks for having me well i hope you enjoyed that one i'm sorry if i sounded like a mega fan or anything but I, I, like i said cog is one of my favorite australian bands they're an amazing thing and um just uh, do, if you've never heard Cog before, do yourself a favor to quote Molly Meldrum and go check him out. Um, I'm definitely going to be at the tour, uh, the vinyl tour, which starts beginning in March, goes all the way through. Um, if you're in Queensland area, so Brisbane, they're playing March 8th at Princess Theatre. Uh, get your tickets for that one. It'd be sick. Um, and who knows, we might see some Cog stuff, new Cog material in the future. Who knows? I'm keen for it. Once again, thank you for tuning in and listening to this one. We're lining up some more podcasts throughout the year, so this is going to be fun. And uh, thank you for supporting local music, live music, all sorts of music. You guys are legends. Bye.